You're in the town. The streets are empty. And in the distance, you hear a low moaning. Yeah, I, I want to go to the inn and meet some nice people that we can talk yes, to. Yes, good idea. Fat Cat is hungry. The inn is closed. And again, you hear this low moaning off in the distance. Oh, fine! We'll go investigate the moaning. You know, this reminds me of a time years ago when I was in a game of Curse of Strahd and the Dungeon Master... Hey, shut up! This is not the time for your stories! Yeah, we're trying to investigate this low moaning that the Dungeon Master is railroading us toward. Okay. Everyone make insight checks to see what you know about this low moaning. Um, wouldn't that be an investigation check, Mr. Dungeon Master, sir? No, no, it's an insight check. Just, just do it. <laughs> 22! <laughs> Amateur. Oh. Fat Cat rolled a 26. Uh. Fourteen. Three. So there we were in Barovia, and we had just met Mad Mary. This low moaning is far beyond your ability to comprehend, and you all continue walking toward it. Well, of course it is. I, I'm not walking toward it. In fact, I'm leaving this stupid town. No, you are compelled to walk toward D it. Don't I at least get a saving throw or something? No, it's it's far beyond your ability to make a saving throw against. Oh, this is stupid. And then we took her daughter's doll, but it ended up being cursed, so... Finally, the source of low moaning reveals itself, and you all die! <laughs> Well, of course we do! At which point, vampires descended upon us all, and we all die! Okay, that's enough out of you! Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Carr, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can implement that you can implement at your game table. Today in the Layer, we're going to talk about the top 10 reasons D&D games suck and what Dungeon Masters can do to fix them. And uh, I'm not going to lie to you, most of these are the Dungeon Master's fault. So, players, if your Dungeon Master is doing any of these things, feel free to just forward them the video in a totally non-passive aggressive sort of way. Yeah. By the way, I recently started running Curse of Strahd for one of my groups, and if you're interested in watching our game sessions, they can be found on my second YouTube channel, The DM Layer Streams. As always, if you have any questions about this topic or any others, feel free to hit me up during one of my live streams. I stream on Twitch every Monday and Wednesday, link below, and on YouTube every Friday. And now, on with the show, top 10 reasons D&D games can suck. Number one, the DM doesn't adequately prepare for the game. Come on, you know this dude. They prepare zero plot hooks, zero encounters, zero of anything, and have the players wander around aimlessly for four hours without a goal. Or after 30 minutes of play, the Dungeon Master takes down their screen and says, sorry guys, that's all I have prepared for today. Fellow Dungeon Masters, I have a very important message for you. Stop being lazy. In fact, I have a special video I made just for you titled, don't be a lazy dungeon master, link below. The bottom line here is to prepare for your games. This is part of the job description of a dungeon master. And if that's too much for you, then maybe you should see if somebody else wants to run the game. Number two, the DM is biased towards certain players. Now this can go either way. Either the dungeon master plays favorites or they have it in against one of the players. For instance, let's just say that one of the players is a super overpowered paladin sorcerer with a crazy high armor class, the ability to cast shield multiple times and a cloak of displacement. It would be totally inappropriate for the dungeon master to single that player out, have all the bad guys constantly attacking him, trying to kill him, and then even trying to take away that horrendous cloak of displacement. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Dalinor. 
Or let's just say there's this fancy pants bard named Nigel who's a hit with the ladies, always gets the cool magic items, constantly escapes certain doom via greater invisibility, and seems to have impenetrable plot armor despite having some of the worst die rolls ever seen. In that case, the DM is playing favorites, and that is not cool. The players will not appreciate that. It's uncanny how all of these great examples keep coming from my own games. Yeah, let's just move on. Number three, the DM not knowing the rules. Okay, let's be clear here. This isn't a total game breaker. In fact, lots of groups have tons of fun playing fast and loose with the rules. When this becomes a problem is when the dungeon master doesn't really know the rules and then proceeds to nerf character abilities or boost enemy abilities based on their ignorance. For instance, let's say the DM has no clue how wild magic sorcerers work, rules that the Sork has zero control over the spells that they cast, makes them roll randomly every time they cast a spell, and then throws a tantrum when the player decides to roll up a monk instead. Now, my personal take on this is to learn the rules and use the rules in the game. Now, I acknowledge that there are lots of rules and it's impossible for one person to know them all, so basically, just do the best you can. Also, I made a video a while back about the most important rules for DMs to know, just in case that's helpful for you. You know, the, the rules that come up the most often in the game. Anyway, link below. Number four, having too many players in the game. Listen, I know it's hard to say no to your friends or even people on the internet who you don't even really know, but when you have more players in a game than you're able to run a satisfying game for, you're not doing anyone any favors by letting them all in. It's really hard to run D&D for large groups and not everyone can do it. So if you can't run a fun game for 10 players, then you shouldn't have 10 players in your game. If you do, the end result will probably be that almost no one has any fun. And you'll probably find that natural attrition will begin to happen. That is, players will begin to leave because they're not enjoying the game. Then you'll be stuck with whichever four or five players you're left with at the end of the mass exodus. Wouldn't it be better for you to choose the players you'd like to have in your game based on your knowledge of them as people and who you think will be a better fit together? Or better yet, split the group into two and run two games. Number five, the DM steals player agency. Can we go to the tavern? No, it's closed. Can we go to the next town over? No, you have to stay here. Can we? No, you can't. Limiting player actions is just plain dumb in a game like D&D. Like, why should your players play D&D over a computer game if you're not gonna let them control their own characters? A hallmark of D&D is that the game is limited only by the dungeon masters and players' imaginations. If the DM is going to crap all over that, then the players are missing out on one of the most exciting and awesome parts of the game. So stop. That said, there is a time and a place for limiting player agency, but they have to do with protected categories. For instance, I like to avoid PvP in my games and refuse to prevent certain themes like rape. But barring certain things that I have very good reasons to not allow, my players can do pretty much anything they want and that's the way it should be. There's a link below to my video about railroading and player agency if you want to learn more about this topic. Number six, not dealing with disruptive players. The power gamer who constantly argues with the DM over every little thing. The player who loudly and belligerently bullies other players and the DM into getting their way. Players who steal crap from other players either in game or at the table. Players who throw fits when they don't get their way. Murder hobos who ruin everyone else's fun. The player who is constantly interrupting other players, stealing the spotlight, and just won't let anyone else at the table actually play the game. The player who always does the opposite of what the group decides just to spite them, be contrary, and sow chaos in the game. Antagonistic players who do things just to stick it to the DM and make their job harder. Yeah, we all know these players, and they can make the game miserable for everyone at the game table. Now, Dungeon Masters, I know it's probably not fair, and sure, you probably didn't sign up for this, but your good players look to you to handle the bad players so that they can enjoy the game. So suck it up and take care of business. Number seven, the game is way too hard or way too easy. 
A gigantic dungeon full of overpowered mobs, traps literally every 15 feet, but with really no reason for being there. A level one party attacked by a group of seven bandits and a bandit captain. A level five party beset by five vampire spawn. <laughs> and I could keep giving examples from Wizards official modules all day long. Okay, my point here, Dungeon Masters, is to know your players. Not everyone loves a meat grinder where death is all too common. And the converse is also true. Many players enjoy a challenge from time to time. In my opinion, the best solution here is to create a game with encounters spanning a variety of difficulties. Some encounters are easy, others are challenging. This helps guarantee your game appeals to a mixture of player preferences. Number eight, the DM's super awesome NPCs always save the day. The party is beset on all sides. Enemies swarm around them. All hope seems to be lost. The players are despairing, discussing which classes they'd like to play for their next PCs. But then a friendly wizard arrives just in time, unleashing a barrage of magic missiles and fireballs to vanquish the enemy hordes. Dungeon Masters, please stop doing this. You are stealing the spotlight away from your players. You are making the game not about them, but about your super awesome NPC. Newsflash, the game isn't about you, Dungeon Master. It isn't about your super special NPC or your precious story. It's about your players, their characters, and how they interact with the situations you place in the game world. And I fully anticipate a swarm of comments down below defending this practice and explaining how it can be done well. But in my opinion, I think a TP key. <laughs> but in my opinion, I think a TPK is preferable to having an NPC rescue the characters. I have never, to my knowledge, had an NPC rescue the characters. That is just so lame in my opinion. Number nine, the DM's story is king. We have all been in games like this, right? No matter what your characters do, it seems like they can't affect the plot line. Remember the time the Dungeon Master brought out the big bad at level five with the intent of just foreshadowing a final confrontation? Remember how you all decided to fight him? And do you recall how you practically had him defeated? But the Dungeon Master pulled some rabbit out of their hat and the big bad ended up getting away? Well, that's because the precious story the DM wanted to tell over the course of the campaign was far more important than your character's actions. Dungeon Masters, no one cares about your story. Now, yes, I'm exaggerating a little bit to make a point. A Dungeon Master does create a general storyline for a campaign. A DM does create different situations and challenges for the players to confront. This is an important part of being a Dungeon Master. However, your storyline comes second to your players' actions. If you rob your players of the ability to influence the game world and the storyline, you're sending the message that their actions don't matter. And if you do that, then they probably won't care about your story. You see, the DM and the players have shared ownership of the story that unfolds over the course of a campaign. So let your player's actions affect the story. Number 10, the DM refuses to listen to their players. If your players come to you and speak with you about something that they are unsatisfied with in your game, listen to them. You are blessed to have players kind enough and courageous enough to do this because most players won't. They'll just give your game the middle finger and walk away. Believe me, I know it's happened to me. Players have been upset about something, apparently, but they never tell me and then they just walk away. Like, how can I improve the game for you if you don't talk to me? So whenever my players come to me and express a concern, either about how I'm running a game or about other players, I take it very seriously. Now, it doesn't always mean that I'm going to do what that player is suggesting I do, but I'm definitely going to think about it long and hard and correct course as warranted. Don't forget to follow me over on Twitch for some chill live streams where we hang out, talk D&D, and even paint minis together. Let me know about a horrible D&D game you've been in and why it sucked. Next week, we'll talk about PCs meeting in a tavern and alternate ways to start campaigns. But until then, click right here to learn 10 ways to keep D&D groups from falling apart. And until next time, let's play D&D. <laughs>